it's one thing to talk the talk. It's an absolutely another thing to back that up. Noah Lyles did just that. Noah Lyles, the American sprinter, 23 years old. He pulled it off. He did what a lot of people thought that he might not be able to do. Not that he wasn't the favorite, but Noah Lyles didn't win his heat. He didn't even win his semifinal. In fact, he had the sixth highest qualifying time, I believe, from the semifinals. And it was a stacked field. Fred Curley from the United States won the 2022 World Championships. Jacob Lamont Marcel out of Italy, he had won the 2021 Paris Olympics. Lyles had won the World Championships in 2023. And then there was Kashane Thompson, the Jamaican who trains with Usain Bolt, the chosen heir to Usain Bolt's dominance in this event. It was going to be a race to the finish, and it was. You see the photo finish right here. The race to become the world's fastest man. So when I watched this live, I thought that Kashane Thompson had won, and I actually thought Noah Lyles was gotten third, because I thought Fred Curley beat him as well. See, Thompson is the, is the guy in the yellow, up, up at the top of the screen. The Jamaican in the yellow, he got his foot across the line first, clearly. And Curley's the guy behind him, you can see with the orange shoes in the middle there. Curley's foot also, I thought, was over the line faster. However, however, that's not how you win gold in this event. The way you win gold, and the way you win in this event, it's when your torso crosses the finish line first. So no matter how far ahead your foot is, it's all about the torso. You see Noah Lyles. What is he doing? He's leaning forward. That is what a champion does. Look down to the bottom left of the screen, for those listening, and you'll see Lamont Jacobs, the Italian, the guy who won the Olympic gold in 2021. He's doing the same thing. He's leaning forward. Because Jacobs and Lyles, they were in the back. For the, about the first 60 meters of this race, they were in the back. And, and Lyles admits he is much better at finishing. He's a closer, not a starter. And that's why he's, at, he's even better in the 200 meter, which we're going to see, I believe, tomorrow night. Lyles is better in the 200 meter because he, it gives him more time to catch up to the rest of the field. In the 100 meter, he needs every second he can get to close out because he doesn't always get off to the best jumps. He was so hyped beforehand, but the jump was his weakness. But you saw Jacobs and Lyles. They both started to close in towards the very end, and they both leaned their chest forward all the way. Jacobs, who I thought was in last place, ends up in fifth, and Lyles, who I thought was in third place, ends up in the lead. Gotta feel a little bad for Kishane Thompson. The announcers thought he had it. I thought he had it watching it live. My dad thought he had it. Pretty much everyone thought he had, he had it for Jamaica. Instead, Thompson ends up with the silver. And Fred Curley, who, again, I thought he had beaten Lyles. Curley ends, ends up with the bronze. But a very fun race. It's, I love seeing the photo finishes. I mean, all eight of them were right there. Sim, Akani Simbin out of South Africa. He had a really good race. And the ninja, Kenneth Bednarek. He had a really good race as well. He ends up finishing 7th, but I thought he did just as good as everybody else. But that is how things finish. And again, for Noah Lyles, he talked the talk. Now, he has walked the walk. Or I guess in his case, he ran the run. Noah Lyles ran the run. And he is an Olympic gold medalist. He's going to have a chance to be a double Olympic gold medalist in the 200 meter. So for all the glitz and glamour of Noah Lyles, for all of the, all of the, uh, you know, he, he really does like to showboat. He's a showboater. He's a gloater. He's a trash talker. You see him before. He's running around. He's hyping the stadium up. He's waving his arms. And for all that, he's earned it. At least for now. He has earned it. Now, he's not the only star athlete to win his first Olympic gold medal. Novak Djokovic, the joker out of Serbia, 
the star tennis player who burst onto the scene some odd 20 years ago as a teenager. At 37 years old, he has won his first Olympic gold medal. Djokovic has basically won every medal that there is to win. Every major that there is to win. He's won the French Open, the US Open, the Geneva Open, the Italian Open, the Indian Masters, the Monte Carlo Masters, the World Tour Masters, the Cincinnati Masters, the Wimbledon. He's won all of these events. Every single thing there is to win in tennis, he has won. The Australian Open, he's won them all. Now he can add Olympic gold medalist to his resume. The path to winning gold started with his old rival, Rafael Nadal. Just to get to the quarterfinals, he had to beat Nadal. He won the first match 6-1. Then Nadal gets out to a 4-0 lead in the second set, and then Djokovic halted him in his tracks, wins the next six straight. So he goes 6-1, 6-4 over Nadal. He wins in the quarters and the semis. Then he has to play against Carlos Alcaraz. And Carlos Alcaraz, the Spaniard, is the guy who beat Djokovic in the Wimbledon just a little bit ago. On July 14th, not even a full month ago, Alcaraz defeated Djokovic in the Wimbledon in three sets. Not this time. Djokovic gets the better of him. He wins his first Olympic gold medal. He's played in the Olympics before and lost. He was in tears after winning. A huge medal for him, a huge personal accomplishment, and he says he'll be back in 2028. I would be amazed if he can do it. He'll be 41 in 2028 for LA. If he's able to come back and play in the Olympics again, that would be insanely impressive. But I wouldn't put him past him. He's an insanely skilled tennis player. So congratulations, and, and again, just because you're a superstar doesn't always mean you're going to win. Djokovic has been one of the top tennis players for so long. Finally has his first gold medal at 37, after his first Olympics was in 2008. Remarkable journey for him in a legendary career that is, I assume, almost over. Let's talk gymnastics. Rebecca Andrade, another superstar, winning her first gold medal. She won the silver in the individual all-around, and congratulations for her. But now t she takes gold, and it's a, historic, it's a historic podium. You see on the bottom left, Simone Biles. On the bottom right, it's Jordan Childs. It's the first all-black gymnastics podium. And you can see they are honoring her. Biles, of course, beat out Andrade for the gold medal in the individual all-around. And Biles said she's ready to be done competing against Rebecca Andrade because the Brazilian is really, really good. I mean, she is a phenomenal gymnast. She was right there with Simone the entire time during the all-around. She actually has a silver in the vault as well. And Brazil took the bronze in the artistic team all around. So she now has four medals at these Olympic Games. One gold, two silver, and one bronze. And finally, getting her moment of glory. So she won it. She won it on... Uh, she's 25 years old. 25 years old. I th believe this is, this is her first Olympics. But yeah, she won it on the floor. Um, and finally, with that first gold medal Simone Biles whose floor performance in the individual all around was what won her the gold she of course gets the silver so Simone Biles is up to four gold no three golds and a silver um and Jordan Childs with her bronze medal winds up uh with that's her second medal of the event Asked if they should bow to Andrade, Biles said it was a no-brainer. Quote, she's a queen. That's why we did it. She's such an excitement to watch. And then all the fans in the crowd always cheering for her, so it was just the right thing to do. And it, it was the right thing to do. Andrade beating Biles out by .033 of a point. Wow. And it'll be interesting to see if she will return. 
Um, will she return? I don't know. She's 25, so she could come back in 2028. She'd be 29. We talked about whether or not Simone will come back in 2028. But my guess is that even if she does return, Andrade probably will never get that individual all-around gold medal. However, she'll always be able to say she has a gold medal in the Olympics, and that silver in the individual all-around is obviously still remarkably impressive. Let's talk the pool. Let's talk the pool and specifically talk the men's 4x100 relay. This is an event that the United States has won a whopping every single time it's happened at the Olympics. So it's a 4x100 medley relay. They do, the first guy do goes and does backstroke, which for the United States is legendary backstroke swimmer Ryan Murphy. Then the next guy does breaststroke, which for the United States, it was Nick Fink who did that one. Uh, then it is the butterfly, which the United States had Caleb Dressel. And then it is the, uh, excuse me, not Nick Fink, Bobby Fink. And then the butterfly was Dressel. And then at the very end comes the freestyle to carry it home. The Hunter Armstrong was the guy doing the final leg. And it actually was Nick Fink. Bobby Fink's the long distance swimmer. He also set a, a world record, by the way, in the 1500. Uh, freestyle event, Bobby Fink. No, Nick Fink was the guy who did the breaststroke. Or the, yeah, the breaststroke. So it was Murphy on backstroke, Nick Fink on breaststroke, Caleb Dressel on butterfly, Hunter Armstrong on the free. We thought it was going to be an easy win. USA has won this event every time since this started in the 80s. It, 10 times in a row, I believe. Or something like that. They had never lost this event. Team China, not a medal favorite. And they end up winning. France was in the lead for most of the time. And let me tell you, Leon Marchand, he performed. He went, he was doing Marchand is the the obviously the phenom swimmer from France. He performed. He put on a show for the crowd. He did amazing doing breaststroke. And every time again, go, go. Every time he comes out of the water, they're chanting, go, go. France takes the takes the big lead. Um the U.S. starts coming back. Here comes Dressel. And Dressel's doing the butterfly. And this is the leg that Michael Phelps used to swim, was the butterfly leg. And this is, coincidentally, this is what Caleb Dressel has struggled at these Olympics. He didn't even qualify for the 100-meter butterfly uh, final. He literally didn't qualify for the final. He got 13th in the semis. He's had a struggle bus of an Olympics. Caleb Dressel needs to go out there and put on a show. And he did. He swam his personal best in the 100-meter butterfly in the relay. And that put the U.S. in a virtually a dead-even tie with France. But China is right behind. And there went China. Whoever they had swimming the, the final leg, the anchor leg, was incredible. Because he surpassed Hunter Armstrong. At the very end, China took the gold, U.S. in silver, France, led by Marchand, the home country takes the bronze. So a disappointing finish for Team USA there. The women, however, they did extremely well. And the women, again, they were actually heavier favorites than the men. They crushed it. They took the world record um, easily with Olympic gold. Reagan Smith, Lily King, Gretchen Walsh, and Tori Husk. The last world record was set by the U.S. women in 2019. Reagan Smith kicked it off. Uh, that was followed by Lily King. Lily King was on the breaststroke. Gretchen Walsh swam the butterfly. Tori Husk finished it out in the freestyle. And so the U.S. women, they made up for the men's failure to win gold. It, it's tough because it's like, are the men disappointed? Obviously not. They, or at least they shouldn't be. They still won Olympic silver. It is a little bit sad that an event that we've won gold in every single time, and this time we didn't. So that's a bummer. Um, but the women, congratulations to them. Good stuff from Team USA who continue to rack up the medals. I'm going to show you guys the updated medal count in a little bit here. 
I want to talk some beach volleyball. One of my favorite sports, beach volleyball. And I want to go through the update. So we'll start with the women's beach volleyball. The round of 16 happened today, so the quarterfinals are now set. So we'll go through the women first. Starting off with Brazil against Japan. Brazil winning that set 2 to nothing. Spain taking on France. They won that one. Two, no, Spain against the Netherlands, I'm sorry. 2 nothing. That was Tania Morena, Mativa, Daniela Alvarez, Mendoza. They took the win 2-1. Um, we had Latvia with a shocking win over Germany. Tina Graudina, Anastasia Kravshinaka winning that one. Two sets to one. We had the Swiss. Nina Brunner and Tanja Huberly. Defeating Spain 2-0 in dominant fashion. They won the second set 21-16. We had Australia defeating the other Brazil team. That was Mariafe, Artacho del Solar, and Taliqua Clancy. We had another Swiss team going to the final, going, winning, their, winning their round of 16 tournament. Zoe Verge de Pre and Esme Bobner defeating China 2-0. They won the first set in a thrilling 29-27 match that just kept on going because it's always win by two, right? Um, and then Team USA, how'd they do? That's what we always care about, right? The second team, Taryn Cloth and Kristen Nuss, they ended up losing. Uh, they lost to Team Canada. Brandy Wilkerson and Melissa Humana Paredes defeating Team USA 2 to nothing. They win 21-19 and 21-18, so it was very close the whole time, but Canada gets the win. On the other side of it, the other Team USA, Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes, they got the win over Italy's Valentina Gattardi and Marta Menegatti. They won that two sets to one. They lost the second set, 21-17, but won the third set, 15-12. So Team USA, one of the teams, will be moving on. That schedule beginning tomorrow. So it'll be Australia taking on Switzerland. USA also taking on Switzerland. Spain against Canada. And Brazil taking on the surprising team from Latvia. Let's talk men's. The round of 16 also happening today. And for the men, uh, we'll start again. We'll start with the non-USA teams. Well, how about? Germany defeating Brazil, Nils Ellers and Clemens Wickler defeating Brazil, two sets to nothing. We had uh, the Netherlands taking down Czechia, as Stefan Bormans and Jorik de Groot winning that one 2-0. Uh, Sweden beating Cuba, 21-11 was the first round. Cuba went down hard in the first round, but then Cuba wins the second set, 28-26. And then loses 15-11 in the final. So Sweden moving on. That's David Amon and Jonathan Helbig. Brazil defeating another Netherlands team. Evando Oliveira and Arthur Diego Marciano Lanzi. Both sets end 21-16 there. Um, Spain defeating Poland. That's Adrian Gavira and Pablo Herrera Alapuz. Winning the first set 23-21. Second set 21-18. So two very close sets there. Uh, then there was Qatar defeating Chile. Qatar wins 2-0. That's Ahmed Tijan and Cherif Yunos. And for Team USA, the first team, Chase Butinger and Miles Evans, they lost to Norway. Norway's Anders Moll and Christian Sorum defeating them two sets to nothing. But the other U.S. team, Miles Partain and Andrew Banesh, they defeated Italy two sets to nothing. So they will be moving on to the quarterfinals and the schedule again for tomorrow in the quarterfinals. Germany takes on the Netherlands. Brazil taking on Sweden. Spain against Norway. And the United States will play tomorrow against Qatar. Well, actually, they play on Wednesday against Qatar. So that should be a f fantastic matchup as well. Uh, also, just wanting to give a little bit of an update on the actual volleyball. I know we've, I, I, I prefer beach volleyball over actual volleyball. But in beach volleyball, uh, the quarterfinals for the women are set. Team USA taking on Poland. 
Italy against Serbia, Brazil against the Dominican Republic, China against Turkey. Um, and then for the men in the quarterfinals, those have been completed. Today, the United States defeated Brazil. They beat them three sets to one. Brazil took the second set 30-28, but Team USA was fairly dominant. They won 25-19 in sets three and four. Uh, France defeating Germany 3-2. to two. Uh, That was a really intense game, actually. F Germany took the first two, 25-18 and 28-26. France takes game 3, 25-20, game 4, 25-21, and then game 5, France winning by 2, 15-13. So a really impressive comeback win for France. Italy defeating Japan, also three sets to two. Japan, again, won the first two sets. Italy comes back. 27-25, 26-24, and then a tie into the fifth round, 17-15 in overtime. So a really impressive comeback from Italy. And then Poland winning three sets to one against Slovenia. And that was a much less dramatic ending. So in the semifinals, Poland taking on the United States and Italy against France. The so U.S. actually, yeah, they play Poland in both men's and women's volleyball. Uh, I also want to give an update on the soccer results. Again, not a sport I talk a lot about. I don't know a whole lot about soccer, to be honest with you. But the men's semifinals happened today. France defeating Egypt 3-1. Spain 2-1 over Morocco. Of course, the United States lost 4-0 to Morocco back on Friday. So the finals are set. The gold medal match will be between France and Spain. The bronze medal match between Egypt and Morocco. Meanwhile, the women, the United States... Defeated Japan 1-0 on Saturday. They're in the semifinals. They play Germany while Brazil taking on Spain. So that should be really fun. I am going to be watching that U.S. versus Germany soccer match tomorrow morning. Let's move over to this, some track and field events. I want to talk about Ryan Krauser for a second. He's the guy in the middle. What sport do you think he's good at? I'll give you one second to guess. It's shot put. Ryan Krauser has been so dominant at shot put, it is kind of insane. I mean, he's he's up there with Usain Bolt levels of dominance. He's up there with Katie Ledecky levels of dominance as a shot put thrower. He won gold in Rio. He won gold in Tokyo. Now he wins his third Olympic gold medal in Paris. And he has been so good. I mean, it, it has never been a question for him. He's been the best in the world. He holds the world record for the best outdoor and indoor shot put thrower. I mean, he's just so, so good at what he does. He's, he's impressive. Funnily enough, the guy who finished in the bronze, also from the USA, his name's Joe Kovacs. You can see him if you're watching to the right. Joe Kovacs has finished silver in the past three Olympics. These two guys just keep going one and two, and I feel bad for Kovacs a little bit because he's consistently been the second best shot put thrower in the entire world, and he's never going to get that gold medal unless Ryan Krauser retires. Like, I, I want Ryan Krauser at some point, like maybe in a world championship or just in some competition, can Ryan Krauser please just let Kovacs win something? Because this guy grinds out so hard, he's been around for so long, and he cannot get the win over Krauser. They talked about this during the qualifying, uh, during the Olympic trials in Oregon. It was like, yep, Krauser's going to win, Kovacs probably going to finish in silver, and that sucks for him, right? And it does. Uh, Kovacs, 22.15 meters. Um, and Campbell out of Jamaica, Rajendra Campbell. 28-year-old, he also goes 2.15 meters, uh, but just slightly less, uh, so he does not, uh, he gets, he takes the bronze, but Krauser at 22.9, so that's, Krauser won by three quarters of a meter, which is a lot, I mean, when you consider these are the best athletes in the world, that's a lot, Krauser is a, he's a beast of a guy, uh, he's eating like 5,000 calories a day, he said, and training eight hours a day. That is some Dwayne Johnson level action. A lot of protein, a lot of weightlifting, I'm sure. I mean, th think about how much that guy probably hits the gym. But he loves it. He loves doing it. Um, and he's really good at it. And he gets another medal for Team USA. So that's good. 
You know, we want Team USA to win all the medals. One thing that Team USA did not win a medal in, not that we were particularly expected to, was the women's 5,000 meter run. I love long distance running. I love long distance running. When I say that, like, I, I really eat up the long distance stuff because to me, it, it's, it's really suspenseful. Watching, I said yesterday about serving. Today I'm talking about long distance running because what the suspense you have when you're going, 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 you never know who's going to win until the very end. So in, it's kind of like a soccer game in that way, but I think it's even more fun watching than a soccer game. I'm definitely going to start watching more long distance running after these Olympics too because I just I can't get enough of this stuff. And I wish there was more. I wish there were more long distance races. Either way, uh, Kenya did really well. Kenya had there they had three runners going one two three. Um, at least that's what it looked like. It was uh, Beatrice Chabe. Uh, it was Faith Kipigon. And it was. I can't find the name of the third. But they had three Kenyan runners, and then Sifan Hassan uh, from the Netherlands, who was one of the favorites to win it. She was hanging around in fourth for mostly the entire race. The controversy, though, I'll get to that in a second. So Kenya ends up going 1-2. Um, it was Beatrice Chabe who won it with a time of 14 minutes, 28.56 seconds. And Chabe went straight ahead of Kipigon to the very end. They were like neck and neck the whole time. At the very end, Chabe sprinted ahead. Faith Kipigon is the one you see in the photo on the right. She won the silver. And the Netherlands, Sifan Hassan, she chased down the third Kenyan girl and ended up taking down the bronze. Then we find out that Kipigon has been disqualified. Kipigon was disqualified, and you see in the picture, what's happening is she's getting into a grabbing match with Gadaf Sege from Ethiopia. So Sege, you see Sege right there, and you see Kipigon kind of pushing her around. And this happened about halfway through the race. It was before the leaders had really broken from the pack, because Sege was actually leading the race for the first half of it, and then she started to fall behind. So Sege... Essentially, Sege tried to cut in front of Kipigon. Kipigon was not having it. Kipigon pushed her away, and Sege almost pushed Kipigon out off the track. Ethiopia appealed. Kipigon was, uh, they, they said her, her medal doesn't count. She's taken off the podium. But then the drama gets even more, because then the ruling was overturned. Kipigon does get the medal. She does win the silver. Um, and so... The girl who finished fourth thought she was getting bronze. Um, Sifan Hassan thought she was getting a silver. Nope, and said Hassan gets the bronze. And Kipigan does get the silver medal. They decided that it was not Kipigan's fault. They said Sege was the one who should be disqualified, not Kipigan. But Sege didn't win, so that doesn't matter anyways. And the Kenyans go one and two in the women's, in a controversial women's 5,000 meter final. I'm sure... Ethiopia, and I'm sure the girl who, who finished fourth, um, which was actually Italian, Italian runner um, Nadia Batacletti. There's a fun name. Nadia Batacletti, she finished fourth. I'm sure she wishes that the suspension to Kipigon was still uh, a thing, but unfortunately for her, it is not. And then the other big story in the track and field today, and this guy is just incredible. If you saw the Swedish pole vaulter do what he did, he set the world record. Not only did he set the world record, he broke the world record. Armand Duplantis, nicknamed Mondo, 24 years old, he already held the world record. And he had already won the gold, because the way they do it, they just raise the bar until someone fails. So everybody had already failed. But Mondo wanted to see if he could get up to 6.25 meters. So his record was 6.17. They raised it up to 6.2. He was the only one who could do 6.2. So he had already won the gold. But the way it works is you go till you fail. And you get three, it's, it's three strikes, you're out. So he goes the first time. 
and everyone's suspenseful, everyone's watching. Goes up the first time, hits it with his knee. He fails. But he got two more chances. Already has the world record. It's like, why the hell not? Why the hell not try to break my own world record, right? Can, we, can I do 6.25 meters? So he goes up the second time. Hits it with his hand. And everyone's disappointed, but they're like, oh yeah, one more shot. This is the last event happening in the track and field. I mean, this was, this was like a television production. This was great. The last event happening in track and field. Everybody's watching. Everybody's suspenseful. As here he comes for his third and final attempt. And he nailed it. He got it on the third attempt. He runs over to the audience, hugs his girlfriend. Hugs his brother. His family was so supportive. I love that the first thing he did was go hug his girlfriend and hug his brother. Like, I will say, no, nothing against Noah Lyles, nothing against the showboating, nothing against the, like, the, the swimmers who just punch the water and they're hyped. The first thing he did, all he wanted to do at that point was kiss his girlfriend, hug his brother, and I respect it. I respect the love for family. I respect the love for family and friends. And Mondo, he's only getting better. At 24 years old, he is a stud. He's a star. I mean, how often is there a star pole vaulter? If there is anyone, it's Mondo. And uh, good job for him. And representing Sweden, a country that... Sweden is the one that gets a lot of medals in the Winter Games. Usually they don't win a ton in the Summer Games. So good for him. Um, good for Sweden. Let's talk a few more sports. Water polo. The quarterfinals are set for tomorrow. Team United States is taking on Hungary in the quarterfinals. Australia taking on Greece. The Netherlands against Italy. And Spain taking on Canada. For the men, we have Croatia against Spain, Greece against Serbia, the U.S. against Australia, and Italy against Hungary. So the U.S. both qualifying for the quarterfinals. Good for them. Um, and then there will be uh, semifinals happening much later in the Olympics. August 9th is the semifinals. The finals are on the 11th. So the last day of the Olympics will be the water polo finals. That should be fun. Um, and then the basketball. The basketball field is also beginning to get set as Team USA locked into the quarterfinals. They take on Brazil tomorrow, 12.30 p.m., France against Canada, Serbia against Australia, and then it'll be Germany against Greece. Those are the quarterfinals. And these are a lot of the teams that we wanted to see, right? A team like France with Again, guys that we like, guys that we know, NBA players, Victor Wembanyama, Rudy Gobert, Evan Fournier. This is a this is a team that is going to be a medal contender against Canada. Shy Gilgis Alexander, R.J. Barrett, Dylan Brooks, Jamal Murray, Dwight Powell. Good team. Both of these teams are rocking some NBA players. There's real NBA talent. The U.S. gets to play Brazil. Not a ton of NBA talent on Team Brazil. Serbia is also going to be a big medal contender with guys like Nikola Jokic, guys like Bogdan Bogdanovic. That's going to be a good game, is my guess. I believe, uh, is Vucevic on that team as well? No, he's not. Um, Australia. Australia, a bit of a long shot. Josh Giddy has been playing well for them, um, but a bit of a long shot is Australia. And then Germany and Greece uh, in one that is... Neither of these teams are really international powerhouses. Greece, it's all about Giannis Antetokounmpo. Uh, if he can carry Greece past Germany, that would be big for them. For Germany, their best NBA player, probably Dennis Schroeder. Um, so there's NBA guys on all these teams. We're to the point where none of these teams are scrubs. My prediction is going to be, I get, I'm going to bet USA wins. I'm going to bet that... I think France gets past Canada. I think the home field advantage helps them out. Um, I'm going to take Serbia over Austria, or excuse me, over Australia. And I'm going to take Greece with Giannis over Germany. That would set up a really fun semifinals, um, which would eventually lead to a really fun finals. And again, the finals happening on Saturday, the 10th, should be really fun watch. Then for the women, 
Uh, the quarterfinals, again, the quarterfinals are set to happen on Wednesday. Serbia against Australia, Spain against Belgium, Germany against France, and the U.S. taking on a Nigerian team that should be really fun, should be really interesting to watch the, uh, the, the Nigerian team because I haven't seen them yet, uh, but they're, they've been good. They beat Australia 75-62. Um, they lost to France 75-54, but then they beat Canada 79-70. Canada was not supposed to lose to Nigeria. So a bit of an upset, but that sets up a really fun game between the U.S. and Nigeria in basketball. Meanwhile, 3 by 3 basketball, they wrapped up play today. France taking home the win against Latvia, and the Netherlands beat Lithuania. Both of those were not even very close games. So France against the Netherlands was the finals. And the Netherlands got the win 18-17, to a one-point game. Netherlands with the gold medal for the men. Uh, meanwhile, France, they take the silver medal. Of course, losing to the Netherlands, but they destroyed Latvia 21-14. They also destroyed Serbia in the quarterfinals. And then the bronze medal game. Isn't this fun? Lithuania against Latvia. Two of the smallest countries. Two countries that really don't do a whole lot in either the summer or winter games. Lithuania against Latvia. A bit of a rivalry there. I think they're neighbors. I think it's Estonia, Latvia and then Lithuania right below each other, something like that. They're, up, they're all next to Russia, in between Poland and Russia. It's a bit of a rivalry matchup. Lithuania beats Latvia 21-18. They take the bronze medal. And Team USA going home empty-handed for the men. For the women, Team USA lost to Spain in the semifinals 18-16. Meanwhile, Germany beating Canada. Germany, who had already beat the U.S. Um, so Germany beats Canada 16-15. So into the finals they go. Germany against Spain in a really intense final game. Germany took the win 17-16. to So Germany with the gold medal for the women. Um, and then Spain with the, with the silver. The bronze medal game was the U.S. against Canada, and the United States got that win 16-13. to So Haley Van Lith and Team USA, they are not going to go home empty-handed in 3 by 3 basketball after they started 0-3. They won four in a row. They won the quarterfinal game. Uh, that was a game against China. They won 21 to 13. Then they won their semi that they lost their semifinal against Spain, but they win their bronze medal game against Canada. So Team USA does take home a medal in three on three basketball. Of course, they're the favorites to win both the men's and women's five on five events. Now I want to talk some kayak cross. Because this is one of the most fun sports that I have watched in these Olympic games. It is super fun. Uh, kayak cross, CNN describes it as Mario Kart with boats. And uh, it's, it's kind of gone viral on social media. It's very chaotic. What they do is they get the four kayakers, and they're all lined up at the top. It, so it's a little bit like, it's like ski slalom a little bit. If you've watched ski slalom in the Winter Games, this is, what, this is basically slalom, it's, it's slalom skiing, but with kayaks and in the water. They start with their 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 gates, and then they go, burp, 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 burp. they go off, burp, they fall into the water, and you're right, it is just chaos. It's chaos through the water. They have to get through eight gates. They have to at one point they have to flip their kayak upside down, and then they go under the water and flip it back the other way. I don't know how they do that. They must like open their eyes, like they I don't know, they close their eyes underwater. They have to blow out their nose, like they just burp, they whip themselves around in the water. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, and it's really exciting because you never know who's going to win to the very end. And even at the end, there's always people that are missing gates. So then they're getting disqualified or they're getting marked. So even if you miss, what's funny is even if you miss the gate, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to win. Because if two of the four miss their gates then the one who finished faster would then finish third, and you know that would be the bronze medal, right? Because they, do, they, do, they always do four at a time. It's never two at a time. It's always four at a time. So I watched the semis and finals, and this is the first year they've ever had it. Um, so for the women, it was the Australian, Noemi Fox, who took home the gold. If that name seems familiar, um, 
you'd be right, because her sister, Jessica Fox, she won gold in canoe and kayak slalom. Meanwhile, Noemi Fox, the younger sister, wins gold in the kayak cross. So the powerhouse Australian sisters, we might have to do a full video on just them. Their mom was also a, a kayaker. But Noemi Fox won the first women's kayak cross gold. Uh, she beats out Angela Hug from France. And the British number one ranked Kimberly Woods. Woods was the favorite to win it. She ends up in the bronze. Um, and Team USA, Evie Liebfarth, she uh, did not make the final. She lost out in the semis. For the men, it was really exciting because it was, it was a heavyweight matchup between Finn Butcher of New Zealand and uh, the number one ranked guy, again, uh, it was the British, Joe Clark. Joe Clark, number one in the world, but Finn Butcher is the number eight ranked in the world. And they have been battling it out this entire Olympics. They were in the same semifinal, and Clark beat out Butcher very, very closely. And it was a race to watch, but Clark did win the semifinal. So Clark, again, Clark was the favorite, number one ranked in the world. Um, and then there was also the, the, the other guys in there, uh, Noah Hegg from Germany. And uh, there, was a, there was a Romanian in there who was kind of a, a, a real dark horse guy because he's the ranked as a, of the 136th best in the world. Well, the Romanian finished fourth. Noah Hag from Germany finished in third, uh, and he did very well. The battle for first place, though. Clark made a mistake. Joe Clark, he let Butcher get out way ahead early, and, and Clark almost looked like he wanted to just show off how he could come back because Clark the first time built a big lead, and then Butcher ended up barely finishing in second. Butcher almost came back. This time it was the opposite. Butcher built up this big lead, and here comes Clark, almost coming back. And the way they do it, they have these two gates, right? They have a gate here and a gate here. And so Butcher went to this gate, and Clark also went to that gate. His goal is to bump his boat, essentially. That's how you pass people in this sport. You bump their boat, and then you pass them on the gate. And Joe Clark was just about this far away. But instead, Butcher makes it through the gate. And then Joe Clark's paddle gets stuck on the gate, and that did it for him. So Clark did finish with the silver medal, but Finn Butcher from New Zealand won the gold. So clearly, this is a, this is a good sport for the land down under. New Zealand and Austria both, um, both doing really well in kayaking, canoeing, um, in general. Like, especially Australia. Australia, of course, Jessica Fox was a big part of this, but she winning the gold um, in both canoe and kayak, really impressive stuff, uh, and then her sister winning the gold in kayak cross, but yeah, this is a really fun sport, I'm, I'm in on kayak cross, I'm, I was already in on canoe and kayak in general, but I am in on kayak cross, I think this is a great sport, great addition to the Olympics, way to go, IOC, all right, so let's talk medal count, you knew we were going to talk about it, China against the United States, it is officially on, it is officially on for the who is going to win the most gold medals. Team USA, the most decorated team in Summer Olympic history. The most decorated team in Olympic history. 20 gold medals. They lead in both bronze and silvers. There's still not a single country with over 20 silver medals. We have 30 now. There's also not a team with over 20 bronze medals. We have 28. 78 total medals. We're the only team over 75. We're the only team over 55. China now at 53 total medals, but China still with 21 gold medals. They still lead us in gold, and it makes that 4x100 men's swimming relay so breathtakingly close because if we had won that, we would have taken one away from China and won one for ourselves, so it would be flipped if Team USA had just won that 4x100. Now, there's still time for Team USA. So honestly, I think the pressure's on China. Because Team USA is essentially guaranteed medals in both men's and women's basketball, which would put us up to 22. Um, Noah Lyles is also going to have a really good shot at winning a 200-meter sprint. That could potentially be 23. Um, 
And so there are, those are the three really big ones left for Team USA, I think. There may be some others that we pick up. Um, but those three, at least, USA is going to have a really good shot at winning. China needs to, I think, the pressure's on China. I think if China gets up to 25, they have a really good chance of winning it. But it's going to be really close. It's going to be very, very close. Uh, France and Australia are locked into a very good matchup as well for who's going to be third. France uh, has pretty clearly separated themselves overall with 48 medals. They have the second most bronze with 19. They have the third most silvers at 16. And the third most golds is a tie with 13. Australia, all of their medals, I believe, all 13 of those medals are in either swimming, canoeing, or kayaking, which is kind of impressive. All, all of their golds. Um, meanwhile, Great Britain also right there at 12 golds, 13 silvers, 17 bronze. So for a little island, Great Britain has done very well for themselves. Uh, 42 is their fourth in the overall medal count. South Korea, also right there with 11. A lot of those medals were won early. A lot of those medals were in archery and shooting events. Well, the archery and shooting are done. So how can South Korea respond? Can they pick up a few more? Japan with 10 golds. Italy is nearing that 10 gold medal. I feel like 10 is a good benchmark. Uh, Netherlands at 7. Germany at 7. Canada still just 5. And they are at 17 total medals. Brazil is now up to 12 total medals with only two golds. Um, Spain is nearing the double digits. They have one gold, but three silvers and five bronze gives them nine total. Um, Greece is up to six with five bronze medals. Good for them. Um, and again, continue to look at the medal count. Let's go to the athletes for a second, see if anything we've missed. And again, it's Marshawn. It's Tori Husk now with three gold medals and five total medals. And uh, O'Callaghan, Molly O'Callaghan, also with five total medals. So Al O'Callaghan took a silver in the 4 by 100 medley for the women's and a bronze in the mixed 4 by 100 medley. Tori Husk, she's actually, she's kind of come out of nowhere. I feel like we don't hear about her all that often. Tori Husk winning the women's butterfly, golds in both the mixed relay and the women's relay, silvers in the freestyle and freestyle relay. She has been incredible at these Olympics. I didn't even really realize this. She's been really, really good. Um, and then, and she's part of that world record team. Um, let's talk about Canadian Summer McIntosh. She has three out of their five gold medals, apparently. Summer McIntosh is up there with a butterfly gold, a medley, individual medley gold, and a 400 meter individual medley gold. That, to me, is the most impressive, by the way, are the individual medley golds. She's won them in 200 and 400 because the medley means you have to do all four strokes, which, is, in my opinion, that's more impressive, which is her winning it and it's Marshawn winning it uh, for France. So that, I'm, I'm really impressed by Summer McIntosh, the 17-year-old. She's also, I mean, would you consider her to be a phenom? I would. Um, and then you've got these archery guys. Um, W.J. Kim and S.H. Lim out of South Korea winning the mixed team, women's team, individual uh, for archery. So they've both been very good. Um, another American swimmer, Reagan Smith, with five medals. Uh, she took gold in the 4x100 medley, the 4x100 mixed medley, and then silvers, three silvers, butterfly, backstroke, backstroke, and that must be tantalizing to be that close three different times. Um, but she was very close, but not able to uh, to win any of those events. But she does take away three silvers. Um, let's see. Anybody else we want to talk about? There is there is another athlete I want to talk about in just one second. Um, another Australian, by the way. Look at this. Kaylee McCown. With two bronze, one silver, two golds, taking gold in the backstroke in both backstroke events, and she beat. Wasn't it backstroke? Yeah, she beat. The American, that we just talked about. Why can't I remember her name? She beat Reagan, uh, Reagan Smith, in both of those backstroke events. So they went one two, in the one hundred meter and the two hundred meter. Good for them. Um, but yeah, going back to the U.S. versus China thing, I feel like it's interesting. 
two countries that have gone head to head on the world stage politically, you know, internationally, financially, and right now they're battling it out athletically. These are the two world powerhouse countries. These are the two biggest, most dominant countries in the nation. Excuse me, in the world. Obviously, I'm rooting for Team USA, but I love that this is what this sets up. It's like, it's not entirely what it was with the U.S.-Soviet Union rivalry back in the 70s, 80s. But it is a rivalry. I think U.S. versus China is a legitimate rivalry, and I'm glad that we have a rival. It would be boring if we were just the best at everything. Come on, wouldn't it be boring? So I'm glad that we have a rival. I'm glad that it is China. So I'm bringing you here to the island of Dominica. Why do I bring you to Dominica? For a similar reason to why I brought you to the island of St. Lucia last night. Check out that video. Dominica, little island country, beautiful island country. If you see in the picture, what a pretty place that would be to live. They just won their first Olympic gold. Thea Lafon, track and field champion, born on an island without a track. She lived in Rousseau, the capital, until she was five, writes the Washington Post. Family emigrated to New Jersey, um, ended up going to Maryland. Her mom became a professor, and she became a track star. She would visit Dominica every summer. She competed in the heptathlon in high school and got really, really good at the triple jump. 30 years old now, and in 2022, after teaching special ed math and a course called Life 101, which, by the way, why don't all schools offer Life 101? So LaFond is a teacher. She's 28 years old. In 2022, she's 28 years old. She's a teacher. Two years ago, she decides, you know what? I want to see if I can win this thing in triple jump. So she goes at, as a 28-year-old and, and quits her job as a teacher to start training. Who does that, by the way? Who does this? at? I mean, she was good in high school. She was really good at track star in high school. But she was basically done at 28 years old and she decides i'm gonna pull up a picture of her she decides to start training and in her first year of international competition she finishes fifth in the 2022 world championships then she finishes fifth again in the 2023 world championships 2024 she beats yulimar rojas the venezuelan um and wins the World Indoor Championship. And Rojas was hurt. So this all of a sudden opens up the door for LaFond. Because not only has she won her first World Championship this year at the age of 30, after not doing it until 2022. How? I mean, I'm just blown away by this. She must be such a good athlete. I mean, she clearly is such a good athlete. Now, her biggest competition is hurt. LaFond goes out there. 15.02 meters. That sprung her into the lead. 15.02 meters. That is a jump. Rain starts to fall. Nobody is touching LaFon's mark. Jamaica's Shanyeka Ricketts takes the silver. American Jasmine Moore, who is also a long jumper, she wins the bronze. But it was Thea LaFond who won the gold medal. According to LaFond, she says she first thought of Dominica when she trained. On days when she did not feel like training, she told herself that if the Dominicans could persevere through the devastation of Hurricane Maria in 2017, which caused $1.2 in damage, if they could persevere, so could she. LaFond said she wanted to give them something else she's been so focused on training she says she's going to go back soon and when she goes back she wanted to bring back a gold medal and she will and now she wants to build a track she says she wants the children to have accessibility the caribbean is producing diamonds the ability to just be able to hop on a track and play around that was her quote so not only is she an amazing athlete not only is she an intelligent athlete, a teacher, a teacher who she taught for six years and then went back and became an Olympic gold medalist, 
not only is she the first, the most legendary, probably the most legendary track athlete out of Dominica, she's also an incredible person. She's going to go back, build a track in her home country for the kids. I can't believe that is there not a track in Dominica? I know it's small, but dang. That's interesting. I wonder, I'm, I'm wondering if, could the Washington Post be wrong about this? Not a single track in Dominica's would be wild to me. Um, maybe not, though. Um, that was according to Adam Kilgore of the Washington Post. But still, Thea LaFond, congratulations. And congratulations to Dominica. You deserve it. You've earned this. I love this of stories like this. I mean, this is what, in my opinion, this is what makes the Olympics so special. It's stories like this. All right, we're going to move on from the Olympics talk. We've been talking a lot about the Olympics. I want to get to baseball for a little tiny bit. I've been off the grind on baseball because I've been talking so much Olympics. Orioles twins, excuse me, Orioles guardians. This is the battle for the number one seed. Now, they went into this, it was a four-game series. They started on Thursday. We talked about it after the guardians won the first two and they won them big. Next two games, Orioles came back. So they won nine to five on Sunday. They have evened this thing up. They would split the series two to two. So Cleveland 67 44, Baltimore 67 and 46. So Cleveland still holds the number one seed, but they have it by just a single game. Baltimore, led by Gunnar Henderson, their superstar shortstop, went three for four, three runs scored, two runs batted in. He crushes a home run. Jackson Holiday also with a home run, his second of his big league career, going two for four with an RBI and a run scored from the nine hole. Colton Kowser with a pair of hits. Anthony Santander with a hit and scoring two runs. He got he was one for four with a walk, a base hit, and scored twice. Adley Rushman, three runs batted in, two hits. And Eloy Jimenez, the brand new DH for the Baltimore Orioles, he went three for five with a run batted in as well. Corbin Burns was kind of off, only goes five innings, allows four and runs, strikes out four, but the bullpen shut things down. At the end of the game for the Guardians, Stephen Kwan going two for three with a run batted in, two runs scored in a walk. He continues to be incredible. Jose Ramirez, another two hit game, two for five. Josh Naylor crushing a three run home run. That made it nine to five. Andres Jimenez also going two for five. But unfortunately for them, their starting pitcher, Gavin Williams, just could not get the job done. He goes four innings, allows six earned runs on eight hits. He does still strike out eight. And the bullpen then, uh, the bullpen was better. Tyler Heron allows two earned runs in two-thirds of an inning. Connor Gillespie goes the last three innings, three strikeouts, one earned run. Final score, 9-5. to five. Baltimore and Cleveland battling for that number one seed. It's going to be very, very close. I think it'll come down to the probably the last week of the season in the American League. Yankees are still a factor as well. They're still a couple of games behind. So tonight, big series getting underway. It's Houston against Texas battling, battling out in the AL West. Houston right now is only a game behind Seattle for the AL West. Texas is five back. So Texas needs to start getting back into things. If they can sweep Houston or at least take two out of three, that would be really helpful for them. Seattle taking on Detroit starting that series starts tomorrow. But Houston and Texas right now, they're tied one to one in that matchup. So some fun matchups again in baseball this week. Aaron Judge is up to 41 home runs. Bobby Witt Jr. is now leading the league with a batting average of 344. He is continuing to push towards 350. As Judge, Soto, Bobby Witt, that's going to be a really fun MVP race. Right now, I, th I still think Aaron Judge is the leader there, though. But it should be a really fun end to the season, and I promise you guys when the Olympics are over, I will get back to talking more about the MLB as well as the NFL. I still want to talk some MLB and NFL, but right now the Olympics has captured most of my attention as it should. I mean, the Olympics is more important right now. With that all being said, this is a long one. Thank you so much for listening. This is Coast to Coast Sports. My name is Levi. Leave a like, subscribe, five-star review on podcast if you're listening there. Leave a comment. Tell me what is good, what is bad. I'm still getting better at this thing. I'll see you guys tomorrow.